the last six months, I've been um, I've been writing to a 68 year old man in prison. Uh, I knew this guy. Uh, he was a contractor, worked in my house, and he had some brothers who worked with us as well. And he'd come to my house several times, and he'd had lots of conversations with me and my wife Shyla and, and my sons. A married man. Uh, I think he was on his third marriage. A father, a grandfather, a hard worker, a friendly person. And uh, he was also a retired school superintendent. Um, but he was also an, an alcoholic. We didn't know about. He was a gambler. And he was arrested for the attempted enticement of a minor. He uh, actually had exchanged some explicit text messages with an undercover investigator uh, who was pretending to be a nine-year-old girl and the girl's mother. And he's now in prison. I found out about his crime because I was trying to contact him to do some work for us. And it had been like three weeks. We had reached out every couple, three days. And he's 68. He drives. He's a hard worker. I was worried something tragic had happened, like a, a car crash or a heart attack or some other tragedy. But I found out what was really happening when I Googled his name. You know, that's what you do now. If like, I'm trying to get in touch with this person. What's going on? You go to Facebook, you, 68, he's not on Facebook. Went to Google and Googled it and found this story about who this man also was. I've been writing him now for six months. And um, when he wrote me the first time, he understood in part what he had done, but he didn't really have godly sorrow. He was angry at the police who he thought had entrapped him. He was sad about ruining this great reputation. He was a retired school superintendent in our area. He was sorry for the pain that his wife and his children had gone through, it, but it was very worldly sorrow. I'm still working one letter at a time to try and crack his heart. Now, I know this is kind of heavy stuff for Valentine's Day, Sin and brokenness are heavy and sad on any given day. Just like Valentine's Day is not the only day that we should love people, sin and heaviness can happen any day. The wages of brokenness and of sin are not just heavy, they're not just sad, but Romans chapter 3, verse 23 tells us they are eternally fatal. The opposite of brokenness is wholeness. And the only way to reach wholeness is to reconnect the broken pieces. For all of humanity, for all of us, our hearts uh, were broken. They were in pieces. They were broken from God and in need of connection. And that's what we have through Jesus. Do you ever feel broken? Do you ever feel far from God? Now I say feel because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's always with us. He's everywhere. He's omnipresent. So the only person who moves away from God is us, but we can feel so distant. Even as disciples of Jesus, we all feel that way. We should. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 Urges us, urges us to own our brokenness, own our fallenness. He says, if we, if we say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. We shouldn't live in our brokenness and fallenness, but we have it every day. And if we say we don't, then John says the truth is not in us. Whether your sin is is egregious like this man that I've been writing to, or, or maybe it's volatile, it's bitterness, it's anger, it's rage, or, or seemingly benign, like it's, it's harmless, it's laziness, or a little bit of deceit here and there, without repentance, turning away from sin and turning towards God. Even those who have once been made whole will feel broken again. In fact, we will be broken again. And so whether it's the man I'm writing in prison or all of us here today, we desire wholeness. We need connection. First John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, John writes, Beloved, let us 
love one another. Man, wouldn't it be great if people still talk like that? Hello, beloved. I'm going to, when Shiloh gets home today, I'm going to say, hello, beloved. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. By this love, uh, by this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And then in verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atonement for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides, he lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. You know, the Apostle John is called the Apostle of Love. Three different times in, in the Gospel of John, John refers himself in the third person as the disciple Jesus loved. And first John here is a, a love letter. It's how to love and how to be loved, beloved, by God. It's how to be connected. It's how to have the wholeness that we really want. Today's sermon is called Connection. And point number one here is love one another. Love one another. How many times have you heard that as a disciple? Love one another. Well, not often enough. Verse 7, Paul, uh, John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Verse 11, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Right there, three verses right there. Right, Love one another. One another. Loving one another is the connection God desires for us. Now, of course, he wants us to be connected to him. But we're not really connected to him as we should be if we're not connected to one another. Valentine's Day, the, the world kind of separates this, this eros love, this romantic love. Romantic love, it's, it's that love that gets the endorphins pumping and all oh, your, your face uh, you get a uh, blush to your cheeks. The blood rushes to your cheeks there. And maybe you remember it when you were a, a young boy or a young girl and, and you gave Mary Jane or Billy Joe a, a 25 cent Valentine's Day, the little uh, tiny Valentine's Day cards. And, and you thought, man, he is it. He is just amazing. Or she is, wow, she's just the most beautiful. Maybe you were seven. You didn't even know what you're talking about, but you just knew if Mary Jane like this card, she might like you, and then she might be your girlfriend. Wouldn't that be amazing? And so you, you gave her the card, and then you punched her on the arm, because that's how seven-year-old boys like girls. But that moment, that, that blush, so soon forgotten, that kind of love doesn't last a lifetime. If you're honest, you probably don't know where Mary Jane or Billy Joe are. You have no idea. You don't even remember their real name. Billy Joe might as well have been his name. Look, you might start a marriage that way where you just, man, you're so, man, I'm just so in love with you, man. It's just, I, I blush every time I see you or every time you look at me. You might start a marriage that way, but you can't live one that way. It's not Valentine's Day every day. The love of the Bible is called agape love. This is, this is a different kind of love. It's not infatuation. It's not the love of a moment. It's a love of choice of a lifetime. It's not about what you can get. It's not about encouragement or affection or support. It's not about you being built up by someone else. But the love of the Bible is about what you can give, how you can encourage and build up and edify someone else. The short definition of, of agape is active goodwill. I'm, I'm looking to do you good, not for my sake, but for your sake. Consider the good of one another, John tells us here in 1 John 4. As a church, 
consider the good of one another and of other churches. So good to be together considering one another's good. It's us as individuals considering the good of others. As Jesus did, as Paul talked about in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And so in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7, John says to consider others' needs, the needs of others, to meet those needs, he says, is to know God. To love others is to know God. That's incredible. Verse 11, if God so loved us, then he says, we ought to love one another. How many of you use the this terminology ought to? I thought when I read this, I'm like, man, it sounds like Southern. It sounds like somebody from the South. I, I am from the great state of Georgia, and I never apologize for that. I'm always from Georgia everywhere I go. Not, not, the, not the European state of Russia, uh, in, in, near Russia, but, but the Empire State of the South. Sounds like something my grandma would have said to me. You, you ought to. And if you ain't doing it right, then you ought to. Ain't and ought to kind of seems like they should go in the same sentence there. But ought to means it's your duty. It's the right thing to do. If God so loves us, then it's your duty to love others. You ought to. Agape looks to the needs of others as God has looked to our needs. In verse 12, incredibly, if we, if we do the right thing, if we do our duty, if we do what we ought to in loving one another, then it says in verse 12, God abides in us. Isn't that amazing? You know, we can want to be like spiritual monks. Like if I just... If I just sit down and pray or I fast every day and I read my Bible all day long, then I'll have this amazing connection with God. And yet God has told us if we want to have connection with him, we have to have connection with one another. Verse 12, his love is perfected in us. God is living with us. His love is perfecting in us. Doesn't that sound like wholeness? God says, if you want to be whole, if you want to be, if you want to be with me, if you want to be connected to me, then let me tell you what to do. Love one another. Our connection to God depends on our connection to others. Now, without God, the other's peace doesn't matter. But if you want to be with God, then you got to be with others. There's just it doesn't matter how many great articles you read about introverts and extroverts and how much you like to feel like this, this is my gift and that's not my gift and how much you feel like other people don't understand me. God doesn't give, uh, there's no asterisk here and, and there's no subtext that tells us who it's okay for not to be connected or to love others. The expectation is if God so loved us, then we should love others. How's your connection to others? Is it Agape? Is it, is it of God? How's your connection to the brothers and sisters in your church? What, what do you think? These are brothers and sisters. Do you, do you have more connections? In your church, in your family group, in your family, in your household, are you hoping someone else makes things better? Or are you the one connecting to make things better? If God looked at your connection to others, would he send you this, this sad Valentine that I read this week? This Valentine said, I once fell in love with someone who only knew four vowels. You guys know what the vowels are? Not the sometimes why, but the other five. I once fell in love with someone who only knew four vowels. They didn't know I existed. We can claim to love God, but if we're not connected to others, if we're not, not just connected, but, but looking to build up, to encourage others, to support others, to sacrifice for others, then we are not connected to God. Some of us 
probably aren't connecting because, you know, in this time of coronavirus, or maybe just some specific time in your life, plus coronavirus, because right now everything is plus coronavirus, and it adds about 50 pounds onto everything you're going through. I know, I lost my dad in August. So maybe you're not connecting because the ought to is overwhelming. When I get letters from this guy in prison, I'm just going to be honest with you. I get the letter and there's the address and there's his name. It's inmate and then his name. That's how you get letters from people in prison. They, they always have to send it out as, as inmate. That's their first name. I get really overwhelmed. Like, man, that's one more thing to do. Like, I'm going to have to sit down and read this. And this guy's going through stuff. And I'm going to I'm going to add some of his stuff to my stuff, and that's going to be more weight. And then I got to take the time. Hey, I don't know about you, but I do a lot of typing now. So to sit down and to write a couple pages with my hands, that was such a weird thing to get back. Even to write the address on the envelope, I'm like, man, can't I print these up? You know what? It only, it only takes me about 15 minutes to read a letter and to respond to it. But I can be so easily overwhelmed by something that takes such a small amount of time, such a small sacrifice. I would say that if you're having difficulty connecting, if it's overwhelming for you, you're probably overwhelming yourself. Now, maybe it is overwhelming. That, that's for you, and maybe you talk about somebody else, but, but you're overwhelming yourself. It, the thing that overwhelms you and connecting to others, you probably think you're going to be on the phone for an hour, and it's probably 10 minutes just Hey, how's it going? And who's going to talk longer than 10 minutes? If you're a brother in here, it might be five minutes. I don't know. But connecting with people might be like, oh, the time and I can't. God doesn't give us a way out. We got to be connected with, with others. Don't, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. A mountain that, that's going to get in the way of you and God. Because if you're not connecting to people, you're not going to feel the wholeness that God wants you to feel. Now, what is that wholeness about? It's not a good feeling all the time. Sometimes it's encouraging. Sometimes it's building up. Sometimes it's painful. That's what it is to be God. God was in pain when Jesus died on the cross. That was the ultimate connection he ever could have made with us. And it cost him everything. Point number two is be loved. Love one another and be loved. Maybe we're not connecting with others because we're disconnected from God. Now, I'm not saying you're not reading your Bible and praying. Maybe you're reading your Bible and praying. I'm a disciple. Disciples should read their Bible every day and pray. But is your heart connected with God? Are you loved? Are you trying to give God something that you're not receiving enough of from him? Not that he's not giving you enough, but you're just disconnected from him. Be loved. Being loved by God is not about Bible study and prayer. Those are how-tos of understanding God and his connection to us and our connection to him. But sometimes you just got to sit down and, and not think about how to connect to God, but why should I connect to God? Just a couple minutes here, we're going to have communion. Our brother Oral is going to pray for us. But if you're going to be loved, you got to sit down and think about why do I need to be connected to God? Verses 9 and 10 here, John says, by this, the love of God was manifested in us. And this is how God showed his love for us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, not, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I, I love verses 7 and 11. Verses 7 and 11, beloved. You know, you know what that means if you, if you went and look what the Greek is there. It's those who are loved, let us love. We cannot love unless we understand that we are those who are loved. I don't like to be too quiet when I'm on Zoom because it's kind of like the radio. You, you doesn't like empty space, but our hearts need space to hear that. Those who are loved, 
let us love. Do you know that you're loved? Now, I'm talking to people who have been, you know, Christians as long as 30-something, 40-something years in this room. But do you know that you're loved? On, on any other day besides Valentine's Day, if you're married, do you know your spouse loves you? My wife is not here with us right now. She, it's a sad one. <laughs> we love, I, I love waking up and uh, giving her her card and I got some flowers for her and she's on the road from Baltimore. Just seeing her in that clip there singing with David, man, I love her. And I, I always remember that she, she loves me. And the more often I think about how much she loves me, the less difficult my work of loving her feels to me. That's what your relationship with God is meant to do for you. To let you drown in his love, that he would let his son die for you, that you would remember that every day. And that would, that would change your heart. That's why we take communion on Sundays. It's not because this is the time of service where we take communion. I don't like that. You need to take that time every day. Drown in God's love. You are beloved. God loves you. He loves you so much that he let his son die to atone for your sins. How does that make you feel that God loves you? That's what I wrote this guy in prison the other day. I said, on this Valentine's Day, inmate, sinner, fallen, did you know that God loves you? Maybe it's easier for some of us to feel like, man, God loves that prisoner, but he doesn't love me. You are beloved. How does that make you feel that you're loved by God? Some of us in this room just feel washed by it, like, oh, God, thank you. Some of us feel like we deserve to be loved by God. Some of us are scared to death to be loved by God because that means I need to change my life because God is so amazing. That's right. Why does God, why does God love us? Verse 8, God is love. That's who, that's who he is. God is love. Now, he, he, there's justice and uh, there's, uh, there's punishment for sin. All that is true, but that's not because God doesn't love people. That's because people choose not to love God. God is love. Look, God is active goodwill for you. God is active goodwill for me. God is active goodwill for everyone in this room. God is love, and we can't change him, and we can't change that. He loves you. And that's what you have to wrestle with in your connection with others. Not that it's hard for you to love others, but do you understand God's love for you? We're going to take the bread that represents Jesus' body, and we're going to take the fruit of the vine that represents his blood. As we do, I want to ask you to consider your connection with God. Consider who you are. You are a sinner. I, I love that Paul says that to Timothy. Jesus died to save sinners of whom I am the worst, not I was. He was aware that he still had sin in his life, and he desperately needed Jesus. He desperately needed someone who desperately wanted him. That's a great connection. When you desperately need the person who desperately wants you, desperate enough to die for you, changes your life. Discipleship may be overwhelming for you right now. Repent. Sometimes in our lives as Christians, We've had the word repent used to us in a harsh way. That's not a harsh word. That's a very loving word. Leave your sin and turn to God. It's not harsh. It's healthy. The ought to's may be difficult for you right now, but I want you to, as we take communion, just, just marinate in the God who knew you and loved you, not just before you were born, but before time began, before you ever even came into existence, he knew you and loved you, and he wanted you to know him. The God who let his son die for you, whether you wanted him to 
or not because your son, your sin demanded blood and God was willing to pay it through his son. Sometimes when we have active sin in our life, we don't take communion. And, and if that's where you are, it's, that's where you are. But I want to encourage you, if you have active sin in your life, repent. Repentance is not something you do later. It's something you do now. And if you really want to change, take communion and let it mean something to your heart. God wants you to be connected to him. I want you to connect with God. And, and that connection is meant to drive our desire to be more of who he is, to be love. When we understand that he is love. We want to be love. That connection makes us look around us and say, what can I do? Who can I serve? Where can I show active goodwill? Where's someone for me to love as God has so loved me? Brothers and sisters, let's, let's really give our hearts to God and think of him as we take communion.